um it, it am i correct to assume that everyone knows each other pretty well am i the only person that doesn't um i mean i think we all just met for this class but like in as much as we've had like four classes together <laughs> cool okay um maybe we should start with that i mean that's something that um i wish we had more time to do in class but i'd love to to learn about each of you if that's cool Elise, if you want to start okay um yeah so i am in my last semester of the environmental management um master's program and I, for the past eight years, have done a whole bunch of weird stuff, mostly international water and sanitation, but also done a bit of like natural building with like cob and straw bale and bamboo. Um, and yeah, that's me. Awesome. Cool. Max? We'll go next. Um, I'm Max. I, well, well, take it back a little bit. I'm from Wyoming. Um, and then I went to school in Colorado where I studied wildlife biology which is a very different track than what I'm on um worked as a biologist kind of all over worked in California and Yosemite and then went up to Alaska for a few years was a bear management ranger in Denali which is usually everyone's favorite fact about me probably is very exciting but also pretty miserable um I did some other random things I worked as a sled dog guide I like did some construction <laughs> um, on a house um, and then recently started coming to Yale to do a master's in environmental management um, this past year. And I guess what, yeah, my, my interests in this, this course and consulting with OSC is probably yeah, to build some consulting skills, to build some develop business development skills, and learn how this all operates. Cool. I bet, yes. would, would love to have learned, read your your essay, personal statement. I bet that was uh, that one great. was a little shorter. I think. Yeah. But. <laughs> cool. Sorry, Alex, I interrupted you. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, hard to go after Max. Right. <laughs> is it? Is it such a cool story? Um, yeah, a short background. I'm English, Italian, French, uh, born and raised in Italy. Uh, I um, started off in law, corporate law, uh, which is what I did in the UK. Uh, worked with a few firms there in London. Decided this is not for me. I wanted to be more on the entrepreneurial side or on the business activity side. I uh, decided to switch gears a second. Uh, did a first master's in Madrid, Spain. Uh, then I went to work for a strategy fin or strategy consulting firm specialized in fintech in Amsterdam. And now I'm at SOM at the School of Management doing um, the Global Business Society program. I still have one year degree. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about, about me. Very cool. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you all for that. Um, I'm seeing the, the, I guess Guillermo is the one who's not here, so we can learn about him um later. cool so I, I, go ahead alex yeah no always always great to know more about yourself as well oh sure yeah um <clears throat> i was in the army for eight years um and then went to som uh in 2019 just uh my first experience with business in the civilian world uh made it about a semester in and decided to start my own company and um pursued that full-time with school and when I graduated this past spring, it's been, again, full-time trying to get my business off the ground, which was essentially reprofessionalizing skilled trade jobs with veteran labor. And that's how I met Marchin initially. And that's kind of spiraled into working with Marchin and working with a different organization that <clears throat> is trying to fix transition assistance programs for service members. Um, so... I live in Maryland, have one daughter, and my wife deploys to Kuwait tomorrow. So this is my uh, uh, gratitude towards you for me being able to meet me during normal work hours when she's at daycare. Uh, of course, that must be a tough transition. Best, uh, best of luck to her and you guys. Thank you. Yeah, she, I'm sure she'll join us for some of our meetings. Um, so I... 
please let me know how I can help provide guidance direction um, here, but I would love it if one of you could just, I don't know, start off le leading what, what do you want to get out of this initial session? How can I facilitate that? Uh, yeah, sure. So obviously I think we're in very early stages of, of the project. Sorry if there's noise in the background. Um, so I think at current stage, we're just trying to gather all the bits, the organization, what you're trying to do, uh, what your mission is, what your visions are, and more specifically then tying that into where we come in. Uh, what could we, where do you see our uh, best value add, um, how it fits into this whole organizational structure and um, you know, the future vision. So I think I laid out a few questions in our email. I appreciate that it was a bit last minute um, and they are quite extensive, but maybe we can use that as kind of a guideline for uh, the discussion and the conversation. And I think serve as a, a great like first step into understanding where we stand, uh, what we can do, and what we should be aiming to do. So right. um, I don't have the email up uh, in front of me, but if you, if you do or if somebody does, maybe we can use that as a, as a structure. If yeah, everyone's can, okay with that, what do, what do you think? I can take us through it. Um, I've got it up as well. Okay. I'll take notes. Um, um, go ahead, Max. Oh, I, yeah, if you want to, if you have it up, then I guess you can take us through. And if you think that's a good structure to sure. introduce us. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's all new uh, to everybody. So, um, okay, so in order, you know, what's the company's history? I'm going to start with my involvement in June um, of this past year. So Marchin and OSE have been up and running since I think roughly 2003, depending on where you draw the date exactly and there are some articles written about it i can forward later but i think he i'll let him fill in the the deeper uh history there um i was introduced to him initially to help him navigate federal benefit programs related to labor so i was helping him get certified for something called the gi bill which supplements uh recently transitioned service members with income as they're going through either education or employment. And a part of that involved creating an apprenticeship program that was certified by the Department of Labor and you know, helping him turn that into reality. So that was our introduction. That's how I got involved initially. The more I learned about OSC, the more I realized that um, there was more to this organization than just you know, transitioning service members. <clears throat> and you know, I just got more and more involved to the point where I flew out to Missouri, stayed with him and Katarina in one of the seat eco homes that he built and saw the campus, saw the workshop, the Hab Lab, um, and the met a couple of the apprentices that were there from the Summer Extreme build, which is the most recent apprenticeship um, or like, you know, pay to play education on site experience that he's run there. And you know, we got the, the apprenticeship approved on paper, but the campus is not ready to support the throughput that we're looking for. And so over that three day period in October, we said, okay, like, how are we gonna turn this thing into reality? You've got the land, you have the open source um, platform, you've got the designs for products, you've built a lot of prototypes, you've sold some of them, but how are we gonna focus our energy into turning what you have now into something that's sustainable in the long run from a business perspective and that aligns with the overall goals and mission of the organization. And, you know, I, I call myself the chief of operations, you know, cards on the table. This is me volunteering. Um, I'm not getting paid and, and he, we don't have revenue stream yet. He's operating on a combination of donor funds and grant funding from the past, but, there's a lot of enthusiasm um, about this organization. I think Elise, you mentioned that you had heard about it prior to this class, right? And so I'm, I, I'm a true believer. I, 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 I totally have fought into his vision, um, which is the next set of questions. So 
this is my take on OSE's mission and vision. Uh, democratize hardware in a way that combines education, employment, and a collaborative environment. And so the premise is hardware is the thing that makes a diff material difference in people's everyday life. And the proprietary uh, environment right now, using the tractor as an example, you buy a tractor from John Deere, you can't fix it yourself. If we can democratize that to increase capability for more people, um, we can empower them to live better lives uh, create an economy of abundance. And the vision ties into that as a world of inclusive, sustainable abundance. So um, it's not um, Peter Boyd approved. So <laughs> I, I, I know that there's some refinement there, but that's kind of my, um, my first swing at, you know, presenting this to a new group, you know, and, and on his website, I'm sure you've seen the way that he articulates the mission for the organization. Um, quite simply, how do we empower people to be more self-sufficient in a way that's collaborative and regenerative for the environment? Um, so our goals. So first and foremost, we want to build a house. The house is special because it's a lot cheaper. It's higher quality. It can be built in five days with 24 people. So it's a from my perspective, a remarkable product that delivers value to the customer and upskills the labor force. The mechanism it uses to upskill the labor force is to use the apprenticeship model, which is we're going to teach you skills on the job. You don't have to have a general contracting license. You don't even have to have experience with tools. Learning those things is a part of the process because if you've ever built a house, you know that you know stick frame construction is extremely straightforward. Um, there's no, no, not a whole lot of advanced physics involved. It really boils down to, you know, two by fours or two by sixes, insulation, wallboard, and uh, some sort of exterior cladding. So goal number one, build the house, prove the product as an MVP. Goal number two, use the revenue that that creates and the enthusiasm to build the infrastructure to support an actual employment pathway located on his campus. And Marchin talks a lot about distributed enterprise. And, and the idea behind this is, you know, all the schematics and the machines and stuff that he's developed over the years are designed to be open source and exported out to the world uh, using existing supply chains. And um, what we like, what we envision really is people can come learn like upskill themselves through the process of developing the global village construction set of which the seed eco home is a part and go out once they graduate and start their own businesses, improving their communities. Um, that could be building the products themselves. It could be teaching. It could be um, a number of things we haven't thought of yet. Um, and so, so the, I guess those are really the three goals. So build the house, bridge the MVP to a product that creates revenue so that we can run an apprenticeship. And the third thing is create entrepreneurs based around this ecosystem of uh, the global village construction set. Uh, I'm always hesitant if I talk too much. So let me pause and see if there's any questions or clarification needed here. Yeah, so I we were kind of grasping with that business model and those ideas. We were grasping with this um, two nights ago. And some things that I guess we're wondering is about is for this vision of you know training entrepreneurs, um, we are not sure about licensing, about insurance. Mm -hmm. like, it seems like there are potentially a lot of roadblocks in between teaching someone how to build the seed eco home, which seems like a straightforward, well-documented project and process that a lot of people could follow. And it seems like there's a gap between that and then actually having someone be able to run this as a their own business. Um, and so 
for us, that was kind of a major, major question. And we were wondering how, how that would be addressed. Just like that's a simple, I guess, logistics question that we don't fully understand right now. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great point. Um, let me tell you how he solved this in the past. So in the past, he has operated a small enough scale and used products that were unique enough that um, the entrepreneurship, you could say opportunity um, had less restrictions. So for example, 3D printers, um, one of the first uh, you know, workshops that he ran was build your own 3D printer from scratch, for example. And people could come in and do that. And um, uh, he, one student was from Malaysia and turned that into a, or, or advanced that into a, a six by six CNC torch table that was CNC operated. And his goal is to then take that back to Malaysia and start his own business. And so <clears throat> it doesn't really directly address the like very valid challenge that you have uh, or that you brought up. But I think the, um, you know, I, we don't know. The, the bottom line is we don't know. But, you know, if, if, if stu apprentices come and they're paid their wages and produce the products and learn and get value out of the program, that's one layer of success. If we're able to do that sufficiently so that they can then go out and start their own businesses, that's just an extra layer of, that's a, like a different level of success. And so when I, when I talk about like exporting the apprentices out into the world to turn the global village construction set into viable businesses, that is further down the road, I think, than from what we're thinking, it's more aspirational. Um, but, you know, I could wax poetic all day about like how I think we could address the, the red tape and the bureaucratic challenges of starting your own business around this. Um, we don't know what we don't know when it comes to, to doing that because it hasn't really been done at scale yet. Totally. So I guess we can walk this back slightly. So first order of business is um, generating revenue from selling the seed eco homes is, am I understanding this correctly? I think that's fair. Okay. Um, and like, and then while selling them and building them through this apprenticeship program, you're going to generate revenue to pay for the apprenticeship program, or is this, are you trying to make this happen before the apprenticeship program even gets off the ground? I mean, I think, I think you could put that as the number one question to the consulting team can start thinking about or helping us figure out. So to me, the decision tree really branches off once the first home is built. Um, so you know, something that is, isn't apparent from just reading the wiki or, or watching the TED talk is there are institutional players deeply interested in what we're doing and they need proof that it works before they're willing to commit. And so somewhere in a bubble <clears throat> that we don't control, but we have influence over is our pots of money and support that have already expressed their interest. And the ball is kind of in our court to execute. Um, organizations like Habitat for Humanity, individual uh, donors that are extremely wealthy that just believe in what we're doing. Um, and so to address you know, how we, how we connect what we're doing and what the timing of the apprenticeship is, the fact on the ground is that you need significantly more logistics and infrastructure on the campus as it stands now before you can bring any apprentices in for any sustained period of time. So, so I mean, that if, if I had a hundred million or if I had $200,000 today, I could turn the campus around in six months, probably. Where does that $200,000 come from? It could come from revenue from the homes. It could come from, uh, an individual donor who sees the success of the product. It could come from a partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Um, we don't know. We don't know what the most likely scenario is. We don't know uh, how pursuing one has an opportunity cost for pursuing other paths. Um, and I think hopefully as we dive more into this, you'll be able to see different possibilities on that decision tree, but um, that's kind of the current situation I, I'm not sure. Does that offer any clarity or does that make it blurrier? <laughs> no, I, I think that that clarifies, I think that offers clarity. Um, 
Can I just ask a, a, a quick question? Um, so would I have two quick questions? The first one is you said that there are people interested in knowing if it works. Yep. If there was a one sentence to encapsulate it, e.g., I know that this uh, um, whatever the statement is true, then it works. So then that may, helps us understand what the greater goal is. Yes. Uh, the question they want to answer is, can we build a thousand square foot single family home for $100,000 with 24 people in five days? Okay. And at this point, you have built a prototype seed eco home and have plans for getting a team of 24 people to build in five days, but haven't actually gone through the actual five day process. Correct. So there's, there's three, there are three complete prototypes. One of them has been disassembled prior, prior to me joining this organization. Um, their plan was they, so the first one was built with a, like a two week, um, pay to play, uh, like you, they, they paid Marchin to come out to his farm to build this house. Right. So, so like that was number one, that was the first house and that's the house that he lives in. So like all the photos that you see on the wiki of the CD go home, that's, those are those photos. Um, so that, so that was the first prototype. The second prototype is Rosebud, which is the production model that we're now referring to as the CD go home that we're going to sell. So the, the design is slightly different, but the principle is the same. And, and that one is what Marchin is currently putting the finishing touches on and reconciling the CAD with the actual dimensions uh, in real life. And so he's, he's, as he finishes the documentation for this, the next step is to get those stamped by an engineer to then request the building permit. The third prototype is a, another rosebud that was the, uh, constructed and then taken down in preparation for another extreme build workshop. And that was paused so that right around the time that I came into the fold, um, as we sort of like wrapped our heads around like, okay, we're trying to do too much. Let's focus our energy and resources on like, let's finish this candy bar before we open up the next candy bar. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the spirit of your question is kind of like, how close are we to actually getting this product to market, right? So the current plan is mid-February or March to have the, rose, the, the latest rosebud ready for showing. On, and so it's, it's like in his backyard of the, the house that he lives in right now. And it's, just, it's like at this point, it's a matter of putting the siding up and um, making sure that the vent stacks from the plumbing are up to code. Simon, um, that first off really quick, but would that second rose bud that you are planning to have ready in mid February or March is that proof of concept that your potential donors need, or the proof of concept is uh, another iteration of that? The latter, the latter, yeah. Because the the one that he's completing now, he has built essentially by himself. Yeah. And so, so the, the, he's confident about a 24 person crew constructing this in five days based on the previous workshop that he ran and the documentation of his labor that he's put into it so far, but it hasn't been validated with a crew of 24 people who have never seen this before. Got it. Cool. And, and do you guys feel pretty confident that you like have a good grasp on what your potential donors want or what like would it be in useful for you to have us talk to them and like flesh out more of their vision or that's yeah, think, not as important i mean that that is a better question for margin um okay. he handles most of the, those conversations i will say that habitat for humanity um if we can go to them and say here is your product here is an example of us building it in real time mm -hmm. and here's the overlap with what you do and, and this is how much we can reduce your construction cost. Um, that is a trigger, at least explicitly from what they've said, that's the trigger for them to say, oh crap, like, okay, can you deliver 10 next month? Oh, awesome. Okay, right. cool.
And um, I, I vaguely remember, did, does anybody have to drop off anytime soon? I think that was mainly if it was the 2 p.m. here yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. Um, unless anybody has any other questions at the moment, Guillermo, um, we had an opportunity, or I had an opportunity to meet everyone. Would it be cool if you did like a little quick intro just so I get to know you a little bit? Yeah, apologies uh, for being late. I think I had some misunderstanding with regards to like what time we were starting. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm Guillermo. Uh, I'm a student at SOM uh, and really interested in sustainability and business. Um, prior to SOM, I was in marketing and business development at a law firm. And over the summer, I was an investment banking summer associate at Citi's uh, sustainability and corporate transitions team. Awesome, thank you. Are you second year SOM? Yeah, I'm a second year. Cool. Are, are classes in person yet? Yeah, as of yesterday. yesterday. In person. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. They were in person all of last semester too. Yeah. Great. The semester was like the first two weeks were virtual. Very cool. <sighs> um, yeah, so so uh, where where should we go from here? You just want one more quick question. Um, so you also need the two hundred thousand dollars required to make the apprenticeship happen, right? That's that's also a pretty uh, important goal in, yes. in in this. Okay. Uh, okay. Cool. That's it. So basically, would I be correct, or please tell me if I'm incorrect, even better, in assuming that the two million goals are. A, establishing whether you can build a 1,000 square foot family home with 24 people in five days, and B, uh, finding ways for the organization to uh, basically get the, have these $200,000 for this apprenticeship to take place. Correct. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> on the document that I shared, so I, I copy and pasted the questions into a document I shared it with y'all. Um, there's a link hidden in there for gl the glide path that we developed back in October when I first went out there. And it lays out a, a very roughly uh, a, 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 conce a conceptual framework for like, how would we sequ sequence these things and solve our various problems? And so um, just for situational awareness, you know, like one of the things that we were toying with is there's an intermediary model here of um, pay to play workshops. And this has been proven in the past multiple times. There's enough enthusiasm around OSC that people are willing to come out, bring their RVs or tents and just build stuff. Uh, and Katarina, who is Marchant's partner, um, has been working on a design for a tiny home, which under our model can be constructed in two weeks. And you know, one of the, the strategies we are considering is, is having people come out, build their tiny homes and either drive, you know, pull them off the lot when they're complete or using them as the apprentice housing as like a temporary solution. Um, if in 2000 is too much capital to shoot for up front. And like, <clears throat> to summarize, I think the, what we're playing with here is you have this capability on OSC's campus as it stands to build the things that you need. And the chicken or egg problem we're facing is uh, getting the people to come out to build the things we need to support the people we need to come out to build them. Um, yeah. And chicken or egg problems are like the, the water in which startups swim. And so really we are open to a lot of possible, we're open to every possibility here. I think the thing I just want to drive home is we're unique in the sense that the infrastructure that we need can be created and produced on site. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's very helpful. Um, I'm going to step it back briefly. When Marchin built that house, presumably for a customer on someone else's land, I'm understanding that part correctly? No, it, all the structures are have been built on his farm. Oh, okay. Marchin With built the house for himself. Uh, no, okay. Uh, the products he's built and sold have included a uh, tractor, compressed earth brick maker, 3D printers. Um, and I, I can forward you all the New Yorker article 
from 2016 that sort of tell the whole story. Um, and, you know, the sense that I get reading up on the history of OSE is um, a really smart guy who's very capable and very ambitious trying to do too many things at once. And so, you know, I think the consulting clinic uh, and you know, really this group is if all you do is help us focus our energy on what's realistic with a clear path um, to grow, even if it's just to the next MVP, that is tremendously valuable to us. And I have to confess like a little bit of self-consciousness here. Like I understand that you're at SOM and you're like a part of the sustainable building consulting clinic and this is not merry-go-rounds or oat milk. Like <laughs> this is a very strange um, thing. And so like, um, yeah, I guess I just wanna say, I acknowledge that. I appreciate the fact that you're here. I hope this doesn't reflect poorly upon uh, your experience in this class. And I hope you have a good experience. <laughs> No, I, I think that this is an exciting challenge. I, it's certainly unique, not <laughs> professional, but I, for me, that makes it exciting. Yeah. I think one challenge he's had in the past too has been, you know, the farm was initially designed to be a regenerative use of land. And so he's, he's partnered with, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, April Durkinson. Durkinson, she has a YouTube channel and, and she profiles like, um, innovative sustainable uh, land use basically so people who have like super efficient homes and um, uh, permaculture facilities and stuff and and so he he's partnered with different um, organizations he's like replanting American chestnuts he's he's trying to turn it into a uh, regenerative uh, and I'm and words are escaping me here but I think you get the, the, the point and so like overarching everything that he's trying to do here is, sustainable, sustainability. Uh, and I know that word is kind of like overused now, but we very much want to remain aligned in everything that we do with an, some overarching goal towards uh, regenerative capital. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess I just I had to mention that as well. Um. I'm talking a lot here. Someone else feel free to step in. Um, my question is, what kind of revenue did you generate during these past workshops? Like how much were you charging per person and what were the costs? Um, I have to get back to you on that. It was something like four, four or six grand. It, it may still be up on the website. Um, per person? Per person. Um, and there were different versions. So some of them were like two weeks. The latest one was a six month. Uh, one. And I think, you know, if the way that Marchin described it to me was there were some challenges because, um, you know, he didn't set clear expectations from the get go. And it kind of turned into a, um, I just want to live someplace for six months and have good Wi Fi. And so there was there wasn't like a, a clear schedule, there wasn't a lot of, you know, personal accountability. Um, they didn't have, you know, one of the key, um, uh, key tasks we have is identifying, like, how do we create enough cadre members or instructors, let's say, to make an apprenticeship function smoothly? Um, because it's, it's, you can't just bring 24 apprentices on, you need to have some way to, you know, you know, manage expectations and give instruction and uh, workflow and, and, um, and, that that's also a challenge that we're working with, but you know the the revenue question. I think um, something like four to six thousand per apprentice, um, and I think he had, I think it was twenty four again as well. Yeah. Sorry. So when those people lived there, where like were they in tents or what were they living in that allowed <laughs> right. them to do this? Um, so it, if you go to the wiki um, and you Google Hab or you search Hab Lab, they have a, I think it's like 5,000 square feet or something. Um, I'll drop a link to it in the chat just so you can see it. Um, this is another example of one of the structures that he built um, in the past, you know, since they started. It was made with compressed earth bricks from the machine, compressed earth brick maker that he designed and then framed internally. Um, and so it's got a kitchen, it's got a bathroom, 
that has individual rooms. Um, and then he had Google Fiber hooked up to the whole farm. But previous iterations were very much, I mean, like the first structure that he lived in was a mud hut, literally, and it's still there. So just to clarify, what is missing with the Hab Lab that makes you say that like apprenticeship programs aren't yeah. ready there? Um, you're gonna have to redo the bathroom, redo the kitchen at a minimum. Um, it's not big enough to support 24 people full time for two years. Um, and there's the bigger logistic concern of food and waste management. So there's no trash service in Maysville. Or there is, but you have to cart your own trash to the dump or pay a service, um, which with intermittent fluctuation or like with fluctuations and who's living there didn't financially doesn't make sense. So, um, you know, I know this isn't like something I mentioned specifically, but if in there was a waste strategy that was a part of this for an infrastructure thing, that would, it would even be valuable because um, one of the machines that he has is a plastic shredder, for example. And his, the, the home that he lives in has the world's only temperate biodigester. So like there's, <clears throat> um, it's closed loop water system, right? Um, and so that, those are additional things that we need to think through. And I mean, we were even considering modeling vineyards in California who have uh, culinary students come out and live and work the fields during the summer and do like family meal, um, some model similar to that to manage the food um procurement and and all that um but unfortunately one of the challenges is like in maysville there's just it's an hour to the nearest walmart right we don't want to have to rely on walmart for all the food it's just sort of a stopgap now until the facility is more uh, functional and like you know further down the rabbit hole you've got an aquaponics system that he has developed um as a part of the seed eco home that you can also do standalone that can produce a lot of the, at least produce that you need. A lot of information, so everyone's digesting it. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, I get it. I mean, if you know, you, you tell me, I'm going to take your lead. Um, because we had do have another meeting scheduled next Tuesday and I know you're all busy. So you let me what you, or tell me what's valuable to you. And, and I totally understand if you want to take some time and think about it. What is, what is margins and OSC's internet presence like? Um, yeah. I, mean. um, I don't know which uh, platform because it's not all social media, but I mean, he's um, reached out and touched at least a million plus subscribers to either the wiki or the uh, Facebook or, or Instagram, like places that he's posted his work. The TED talk definitely helped. Um, the New Yorker article definitely helped and hurt a little bit because it, you know, exposed a lot of the bad as well as the good. Um, and he's in a position now where I think if he posts something, um, it's going to get attention. I mean, he still has previous attendees reach out to him and ask him when the next workshop's going to be. So we, we have a sense that there's still lingering interest, even though things have slowed down um, at a pretty large scale. We just don't, you know, have good analytics, or at least I don't off the top of my head. Okay. I mean... Because looking toward even platforms like YouTube, not even pay to subscribe platforms. Right. But some people successfully generate an enormous amount of yeah. revenue. <clears throat> doing, doing very similar and interesting things, you know, like woodworking, yeah. building, tiny homes, van life, which is, yeah. Um, <laughs> things that are often less interesting than what's going on at open source ecology. But definitely no sometimes requires a specific type of person and a very specific presence online yeah like the one of the guys i follow mr chickadee is his like title on youtube and he 
never talks, you know, or when he does talk, it's like, but like, to your point, there is a world in which you're, we're just documenting what he does and then publishing it because that even that would be useful. I think the challenge right, like right now, and this applies sort of to, you know, how OSC interacts with potential collaborators who are not a, like officially part of the organization is like, it's just rough around the edges. So it's not super, the production value is very low. Um, you know, he's a classic engineer in that standpoint in terms of like he, the product should speak for itself or, you know, um, there's not a lot of, of effort put into promotion. And I think that's a, a, a extremely valuable opportunity if we just get the right touch to help uh, manage the content and refine it a little bit. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, Max, you like, I, as we were thinking sort of our labor recruiting challenges, like how are we going to get the first crew? Um, it would be to target people like you who have had experience in the outdoors. I mean, frankly, everybody in this call, but uh, specifically people like you who have had experience like in the outdoors and sort of an unconventional career path. And um, we would like to figure out a recruiting strategy that effectively targets that. And I didn't do so great in marketing class. Um, so like that's another thing that um, would be extremely valuable is, is how we're thinking. And there's a link also to our current approach to how we're gonna recruit. And are they paid, unpaid? Do we adopt the pay to play model and charge the homeowner or you know what, what the different possibilities are there? Yeah, um, I mean, it'd be great if, yeah, we could figure out a way to be building, to kind of be accomplishing some of these things at once, like build, build the seed eco home, demonstrate the MVP with in five days with 24 people, have someone else, you know, buy materials and right. have, you know, constructed on their land. Um, and then, you know, have the people who are learning how to build the seed eco home be potentially paying for this experience right um. <clears throat> uh, i mean we are the research that we've done like our benchmark right now for or the price to be you should say or i should say of the uh media documentation of the first build is something like 30 grand <clears throat> so for 30 grand a, a professional production company will send people out to document the build in a way that i think is you know, sexy enough to um, like really promote OSE in a meaningful way. Um, and where we're, we're kind of considering, you know, is does that make sense? So that could be another question um, that's worth investigating a little bit more. Does does Martian have any interest in honing his his YouTube skills or presence? What about <sighs> his arena? Like my my you know, I, I've only known him for about a year. Like he is interested in everything. And so he, like, we will, we'll, we'll correspond a lot. Like, Hey, did you see uh, this? Like, did you read radical markets? And like, what, I want to know your thoughts on the cost and Georgian economics. And then like the next day it'll be, um, you know, like, how are we going to get, you know, I think veterans are the, the right talent pool to target for this thing. Like, how, how do you think we can do this? And, and so bounces a lot, bounces around a lot. And I spent a lot of my time, um, I guess, you know, helping him, helping remind him that like, like what you're doing right now doesn't feel like it's accomplishing a lot, but um, this is all a part of the plan. Like we, we have, we've laid out a strategy, we have a plan. Now let's like, like actually execute it and try not to get distracted by all the other possibilities. I don't know if that's right. I don't, you know, it's, it's, I'm kind of following my instincts from previous leadership experiences, but um, you know, that, that's just the current situation. Makes sense. Maybe kind of bringing it back to the, uh, the project as a whole. Um, some questions in terms of how you would like or what your ideal vision of a deliverable is. In that, would you want, I don't know, a PowerPoint presentation, a report, uh, <clears throat> a, uh, or is it the actual... I don't know. I don't know if there's any any other ways that we can deliver it. Yeah, uh, team that I'm missing out on. But what's your what's your ideal vision that comes out of our when we get to that deadline or to that last meeting? 
right. what do you expect to have received from us? Uh, I, we would like a living document that we can reference when the project concludes. Um, the format doesn't matter. We have found, or, you know, I've fallen into his way of working, which is uh, the Google suite linked to the wiki. So like if you just peruse the wiki, you will see like the Google slides that are embedded and with, you know, easy edit links. Um, that is sufficient. And beyond that, I think um, we don't I, don't, I don't know that we have any constraints to place on you. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not sure that helps you <laughs> or hurts you, <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, like in this, go, going off of what I was just talking about in terms of sticking to the plan or following a, a coherent strategy, um, uh, I'm not sure what the good analogy here is, but like got, we need guideposts, we need, we need concrete milestones, we need, um, you know, from my days in the military, mission decision line. So, so uh, key performance indicators, the big rocks, I guess, as you would say, um, <clears throat> and uh, guideposts, yeah. Are there any other buzzwords I can throw out? Yeah, yes, yeah. so it's it's all really about like making sure we can kind of plan uh, a clear vision with a uh, clear kind of steps to take to be able to do it. Because from my understanding, there's a there's a lot of lot of great ideas, but it's about understanding how we can actually refine them and keep them in target with with what you're trying to achieve. Exactly. exactly. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and then I, I guess kind of a, a general question would. What do you aim to do with the recommendations that come out of uh, out of our couple months exploration and ultimate recommendation? Is it something that you're looking to implement? Is it something that you're looking to have as a good to know? Is it? I, I mean, you know, considering it, considering like my experience, I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to articulate this very well, but like. When this project is over, if we have the ability to go back and reference, say like, okay, is what we're doing aligned with what was recommended to us? And if not, do we have a good reason to do that? And what was the rationale behind these recommendations? That is, um, that is a source of clarity for us that doesn't currently exist because I am a part of this organization because I believe in it. I don't have any real world experience building companies like other than my own startup. Like I don't have any real world experience in knowing how conventional or other businesses operate. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, something, something so that a reference point for us to compare our strategy and actions to from you know, really what is an objective third party stress test uh, in this group of that actually doesn't make sense and here's why. Um, that's kind of what I think we're going to to utilize this product or this this project for going forward. I don't know. Does that make sense? Is is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. What what is beneficial for the group in terms of the class? Like like what <clears throat> what can we do to ensure that you know, this is a enriching experience for you as opposed to just another homework assignment. <clears throat> like, like, is there, it, should we center this around some sort of like metric that you help, you, you increase profitability by X percent or, you know, I, I'm not really sure how I can, how we can be working together to like make sure that you're not, you know, I don't, I don't know, spinning your wheels for a grade. Do you have something, Alex? <laughs> don't don't think I do. Don't think I do. Um, I, I think yeah. I mean, just it's just about yeah, determining a clear project that we can jump on and making sure that that's the or whether it's one or two kind of answers that we want to or like two questions that we want to solve. 
and then stick through with those questions and go through it from beginning to end uh, and kind of making sure that we, we remain on track. Um, I, I've kind of done one of these experiences before. It was quite interesting. We're like uh, advising a Spanish group who did, what did they do again? Um, they crisis communication management. And it was launched by these two 60 year old Spanish people who barely spoke much English. And kind of like the idea just kept changing every week. And what we what was told like from week to week just kept varying. So I think that that's always tends to be stressful. Okay. It doesn't tend to be beneficial for either of the parties really because you end up getting a recommendation that <clears throat> might be half-baked or like not properly examined throughout. Uh, so yeah, I think if maybe from this meeting, maybe we, we speak internally as well and maybe next week's meeting with Martin, uh, maybe we can try to yeah, exactly just put those one or two uh, ultimate guiding stars that will lead us throughout the entire project. Uh, that's always useful. Okay. Um, but uh, with regards to metrics or no, I, I just want to be able to make sure, make sure that we can actually have an impact on your organization. I think that's the most exciting uh, part is actually that it has a real world impact and it's not just homework, you know, um, and it's all about working together in, in, in achieving this. So uh, the clarity and openness on our behalf, but also on your behalf, which you haven't been 100 percent with uh, so far. So I'm not worried about that at all. OK, cool. Well, hey, look, at the end of the day, you're going to make Marchin and myself better. So even if OSC isn't standing in a year, uh, which it will be, but um, ho hopefully that offers you some consolation. <laughs> Absolutely. What about the, the rest of the team? I don't know if they have anything to add. Um, I definitely agree that I, I'm very excited to just like to contribute to OSC. I do think, especially since you've gone through SOM, like you giving us critical feedback as to how we should be better consultants would okay. also be useful. Um, yeah. I went, I went to two consulting club meetings before I, I decided to start my own company. So, cool. <laughs> Misi, uh, what, what? <laughs> I mean, you went to more consulting club meetings than I did so. <laughs> <laughs> already. Uh, yeah. But even just like, I feel like if we got into a professional setting, clients wouldn't necessarily give us feedback for us to learn from as openly. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Cool. Okay. So, so maybe take some time, digest, and we reconvene next Tuesday. Is that? Sounds great. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, the, for Tuesday the 15th, the current time is 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, is that still good? I thought Marchin said that was not good for him, so he proposed moving that to 2 p.m. Eastern. Right. I, I'm happy to do that, but you tell me, Max. Well, that's not good for a bunch of us, right? Yeah. So yeah, I guess that's on 240. Should we split the difference, like meet at 1.30 and then a bunch of us will have to leave by 2.20, but then Martin can catch the end of it. Would that be? Let's leave it at one for now because I'm actually not sure if that was a one-off meeting for him or if he was okay. referring to today's 1 p.m. conflict. Uh, so, okay. yeah, so uh, we'll just leave it at one for now and then I will get back to you if and we have to change that. Sounds good. Great. Um, Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for... Uh, yeah, th this is this. Is, I'm excited about it, and uh, I look forward to the next week. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, thank, thank you, you for, uh, for your flexibility as well. All right, y'all, take care. I appreciate it. Have a Thanks. great week. Take, take care. Bye.